Tonight, life in prison. Alex Murdoch ordered to spend the rest of his life behind bars. The disgraced former attorney shackled in a prison jumpsuit, facing the judge one final time, a day after the jury found him guilty of murdering his wife and son. The judge addressing Murdoch directly at length, telling him he will see his slain family members at night when he tries to go to sleep. How Murdoch responded today in court and why his lawyers say they're planning to appeal his conviction. Deadly tornado outbreak, the terrifying scenes across the South. At least seven tornadoes touching down, leaving a wide trail of destruction. The dangerous system now barreling east. 80 million people under wind alerts. Bill Cairns standing by with the track. Killer clues? The bombshell release in the Idaho College murder investigation. Authorities releasing the full list of items seized from the suspect's home in Pennsylvania. The weapons police say they found inside. Rare anti-government protests erupting in Israel. Crowds surrounding the prime minister's residence, trapping Netanyahu's wife inside of a hair salon until she was escorted out by police. What's fueling this violent escalation? Back here at home, an incredible rescue caught on camera. Police racing to save a driver who crashed into a canal. The new iPhone feature that may have saved his life. And first steps. Tonight, we'll bring you the incredible story of one little girl finding her footing after fleeing the war in Ukraine. The father-daughter moment, years in the making. Top story starts right now. We begin top story tonight with Alec Murdoch's stunning fall from grace. In the courtroom where he once practiced law, Murdoch standing face to face with the judge as a convicted murderer. Murdoch handcuffed and in a prison jumpsuit, you see him right here, waiting to learn his fate a day after 12 jurors unanimously found him guilty in the murder of both his wife and his son. In a series of extraordinary exchanges, Judge Clifton Newman, speaking to Murdoch directly, at times seemed sympathetic and at others incredulous in this moment, noting the irony that the prosecution did not seek the death penalty in this case. But over the past century, your family, including you, have been prosecuting people here in this courtroom, and many have received the death penalty, probably for lesser conduct. And then there was this chilling moment. The judge also telling Murdoch he'll likely see his son and wife's faces when he tries to go to sleep at night knowing what he did to them. After delivering that message, the judge handing down two consecutive life sentences, Murdoch taken out of the courtroom and booked at the Kirkland Correctional Center in Columbia, South Carolina. You can see him here with a shaved head as he moves into the maximum security prison where he will spend the rest of his life. NBC's Katie Beck is at the courthouse once again for us tonight. Before Alec Murdoch's fate was sealed, entering court in a tan jumpsuit and shackles, Judge Newman offers the disbarred attorney who once practiced in the same court a final chance to speak the truth. But I'm innocent. I would never, under any circumstances, hurt my wife Maggie, and I would never, under any circumstances, hurt my son Paul Paul. Well, it, and it might not have been you. It, it might have been. Uh... The monster you become when you uh, take 15, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 opioid pills. Newman, who has reserved opinion and comment on the case for six weeks, speaking from the heart Friday about Murdoch's tangled web of lies. To have you come and testify that it was just another ordinary day that my wife and son and I were out just enjoying life. Not credible, not believable. You can convince yourself about it, but obviously you have the inability to convince anyone else about that. But Murdoch's defense team feels ultimately that it wasn't fair. They plan to appeal on grounds that Murdoch's financial crimes should have never been admissible. So it was judicial bait and switch. Murdoch's team says they wavered on whether he should testify in his own defense, but in the end decided without it, he'd have no chance to be found innocent. If he didn't take the stand, a lawyer um, who's been accused of mutilating his wife and son, what would the jury think of that? 
it was really a tough call in this case. Was he always solid on the side of wanting to testify? Pretty much, yes. At times during the trial, Jim Griffin, who was originally retained to represent Paul Murdoch in the 2019 boat case, overwhelmed with emotion. I respectfully request that you do not compound a family tragedy with another. Thank you. Never once during the whole uh, period of time did I ever think Alec could have murdered Maggie and Paul. And then I sit here today, um, my belief in that is as strong as it was um, the day they were murdered. Would you call Alec Murdoch your friend? Yeah, he, he, he is my friend. I am, um, like many others, I'm disgusted with his conduct as a lawyer and he's put a black stain on the legal profession. He has been very gracious, very humble. But for the judge, amends aren't enough, handing down two consecutive life sentences, saying accountability has come to call and will for all of Murdoch's remaining days. And I know you have to see Paul and Maggie during the night times when you're attempting to go to sleep. I'm sure they come and visit you, I'm sure. All day and every night. Yeah, I'm sure. Katie Beck joins us now from Wallerboro, South Carolina. Katie, I want to go back to those moments we just saw there. The judge in your piece, and it, it, what was the mood in the courtroom? Because it, it, it seems so bizarre at times, so intimate and, and yet so chilling. Yeah, I think there there was not a single sound in that courtroom because it was so powerful. It was so intense. And rarely do you see a judge sort of take off the judge robe and put on sort of the human one. I mean, this judge was actually speaking uh, from a place of depth, from a place of, um, of humanity, really, talking about, you know, hearing Maggie and Paul coming to him at night and also just saying, look, you know, your story was incredible. Like, I'm giving you a chance to sort of explain or admit or apologize apologize and you're still going back to what we've heard from the stand which is over and over denying that you had anything to do with this so it was a very very you know as you said chilling moment and I think that you know I don't know that anyone was prepared for that this judge has remained silent and without opinion throughout this trial as judges should uh, so to hear this huge huge outpouring today uh, it was quite an event. Yeah, it was something you definitely do not see every day in a courtroom. Can you tell us anything more about the timeline for the Murdoch appeal? Yeah, I would expect it to happen sometime in the next month. Uh, they will be filing all the way to the Supreme Court on the grounds that this evidence in the financial cases should not have been admitted in this trial. And that is because they say it prejudiced the jury, that, that basically they made the connection, as he said in the piece, a, a sort of judicial bait and switch that if he did this crime, he probably did this one. If he's a bad person because he stole, he's probably a bad person and committed a murder. So they say the jurors made that, left, that, made that leap because of the fact that these crimes were allowed in and they shouldn't have been. So I think they will make that argument. They have to know what a steep hill that is to climb, though, in the, in the legal sense. I mean, it is very, very rare that any court is going to overturn a jury verdict. Okay, Katie Beck, Katie, we appreciate it. We want to bring in now a special guest who ha we had on earlier this week. Richard Gabriel is a trial consultant and an expert on jury research who has worked on high-profile cases, including O.J. Simpson, Casey Anthony, and Aaron Hernandez. Richard, thanks so much for joining Top Story. I want to start with a clip from an interview with the juror and ABC News. Let's take a look. For some people, it's so hard to understand how a husband, especially a father, would kill their own son. What made you so sure that he had? His responses, how quick he was with the defense and his lies, steady lies. Did you feel like he was a liar? A good liar, but not good enough. What did you think when Alec Murdoch took the stand? I didn't think much of him. Really? Really. I didn't see any true remorse or any compassion or anything. Even though he was, he, he cried a lot on the he, stand. He never cried. He never cried. What do you mean by that? All he did was blow snot. Did you not see tears? No tears. How did you know he wasn't crying? Because I saw his eyes. I was this close to him. 
Richard, as I pointed out earlier this week, high-profile defense attorneys pay you a lot of money to sort of research jurors, to study juries during the trial. What do you take from, from what the juror said here? Essentially, it sounds like Alex Murdoch did himself no favors by taking the stand. It's, it's so difficult whenever a defendant tries to take the stand for two reasons. One, instead of creating reasonable doubt in the prosecution's case, it, the case becomes solely about the defendant. And he was on the stand for such a long period of time, it allowed these jurors to really scrutinize every little nuance, every little tick, every little you know, behavior to analyze it and to, f and to find if there's inconsistencies. And you saw this jury, this juror said, I didn't see any tears. And he looked at him, he was looking at his response, the too quick response. It looked like a polished performance to him. He knows he's an attorney and he just didn't respond well. And that is the huge risk that any defense attorney and any defendant takes. It, when we were on the O.J. Simpson case and the Phil Spector case, and even the Casey Anthony case, all of them want to testify, but it comes with a huge risk because jurors are always going to look at them with a critical thing instead of a sympathetic eye. And then, Richard, we know from that interview that when the jurors headed into the deliberation room, right, this was the breakdown from what we understand. So two not guilty, one not sure, and the other nine jurors thought he was definitely guilty. With those types of odds, is there any way of that jury either being a, a hung jury or flipping the other way. Is, was the math just against Alec Murdoch once the trial ended? Oh, yeah. I mean, the truth is that when you have nine on one side, that's that's momentum. That's really pushing in one direction. The only way you can salvage a hung jury from that usually is if somebody is such a, such a strong opinion is just going to fold their arms and say, nope, I'm not moving. I think he's innocent. I'm not going to move on this. The, but the truth is that there's always two or three main jurors who are the four people or the opinion leaders. And they're, if the two people or the three people that are uncertain are not not that strong and they're talked into it or they just have some mere questions there, then it's going to move in that direction. And as you saw, whenever there's a, a verdict driven decision, in other words, let's just take a vote right now, who's in, who's out, then that's usually a quick decision as we saw. You know, Richard, we, we know that, that there was going to be a little bit of drama today. We, we had no idea what was going to happen between the judge and Alec Murdoch, I know you've seen a lot of court cases, you've seen a lot of trials, you've spent hours in courtrooms, right? H have you ever seen anything quite like this? Because, I, you know, you had a judge here, and, and it's his job to make sure that case runs smoothly and then hand down that punishment, but it seemed to sort of elevate with this judge. He seemed to take it to a different level, almost to a spiritual level, if you will. Well, it, it was unusual, but this case is unusual. First of all, this is a, a smaller community, and the legal community in this in this town, in this area, is especially in this... The Murdochs have such history here that I think the judge said, look, this isn't just about a a murderer or about a convicted murderer or any any normal defendant. This is about one of our own. This is about someone who is a prosecutor, someone who is a lawyer and esteemed member of our profession. And so I think he felt like, I have to speak to this because it speaks to me. It speaks to how people will see us in this town, in this county, and in our profession. And I think it touched him and he felt like he had to speak to that. Richard Gabriel, it's been a pleasure having you on the show this week. Thanks so much for your time. There's another big story we're following tonight. It's that deadly severe weather. We've been watching it all week, really. At least seven reported tornadoes sweeping through the south, leaving behind devastating damage across four states as millions brace for another dangerous night ahead. Here's Morgan Chesky. Tonight, a deadly storm system launching devastating winds. Tornado crossing the road right in front of us. And a frightening spree of tornadoes. It's hitting debris. We got debris in the air. Is it a house? Yeah, debris in the air. In 24 hours, at least seven twisters have carved destructive paths through four states, tossing semi trucks on highways and leaving homes in pieces. My truck was shaken. The neighbors lost their roof. We lost a. Uh, Part of our roof. In Texas, the power of straight line winds, undeniable. Gusts topping 70 miles per hour, shredding a boat marina in seconds, tearing off its roof, sending debris flying. In Alabama, some woke up to a nightmare. We didn't hear anything until plywood crashed through our window. So all we heard was a giant crash. Tonight, high winds and flash flooding, responsible for at least five deaths across several states.
Now, as the storm churns east, more than 80 million Americans are under wind alerts. So, Princeton, this storm is right on top of you. The wind gusts here, 60 miles per hour likely. At least one reported tornado hitting Kentucky. We have already lost way too many people due to flooding, tornadoes, and other weather events. So we want everybody to be safe today. Morgan Chesky joins us tonight from Dallas. Morgan, a stern warning there from the governor. We know tens of thousands of people are still without power back in Texas. What's the latest on those outages? Yeah, Tom, fortunately, crews have been able to make some significant progress. At last check, there are less than 40,000 customers in Texas without power. But unfortunately, as we see this storm make its way east, other areas are only seeing those numbers we go up. We know that in the greater Nashville area alone, there were reports at noon today, more than 100,000 people without power. We know crews are trying to get those lines back up and running. Uh, but important to know here, Tom, this storm is far from over. All right, Morgan Chesky, because of that, we want to get right over to Bill Karens, our meteorologist, who's joining us live tonight. Bill, walk us through what we should expect tonight into the weekend and, and next week. Yeah, we're still dealing with one of the strongest storms we've ever recorded in the Ohio Valley. It's actually one of the lowest pressures in Indiana going back 100 years. So the storm right now has produced a lot of wind damage. I mean, a ton of wind damage. Over a million people right now don't have power. The 911 call center in Louisville has put a memo out to everyone saying only call 911 if there's life-threatening injuries. Don't call if there's power lines down or trees down. That's how busy it is right now in that area because of these severe storms. So the severe threat from this storm system is ending. We're our last tornado watch will expire here at 8 p.m. this evening, and we haven't had any reports of any tornadoes since earlier this afternoon, so that's good. But the high winds continue, especially in Kentucky. Kentucky alone has a half a million, half a million people without power tonight in southern Ohio and then through the Appalachians, even through the southeast tonight and tomorrow. It's going to be very windy. And on top of this, after the sun has set, the snow has broken out. We have near blizzard conditions in Detroit. We are going to experience 6 to 12 inches somewhere in a narrow band here, southern portions of Michigan. And then later this evening, all all of the heavy snow will move into the northeast. Now, it's only going to stay snow north of Albany. It's going to be a wintry mess, snow to sleep back to snow for the Catskills, central New York, and areas in especially north of the Mass Pike. So it's snow totals. It looks like around 4 to 8 for Albany, Boston about 2 to 4, nothing in New York, nothing in Chicago, and somewhere near Detroit around 3 to 6. Now, Tom, that wasn't enough. Guess what? We're reloading. Another storm is coming into the west. We're going to see another 1 to 5 feet of snow in the Sierra. Those people still are trying to dig out and get rescued. Yeah, still a wild scene there. Okay, Bill, we appreciate that. New details tonight on the ongoing cleanup efforts in East Palestine, Ohio, after a toxic train derailment almost a month ago. A new air quality report showing elevated levels of a chemical that could lead to health issues. The community now pressing government and Norfolk Southern officials for answers. Our Jesse Kirsch has the latest. Um, Tension boiling over in East Palestine. Residents sharing health and financial worries at a tense town hall Thursday, demanding answers from government officials and getting a rare opportunity to grill a representative from Norfolk Southern itself. We are sorry. We're very sorry for what happened. We feel horrible about it. You care about Has there been any talk about relocating people? There is not. Residents also questioning why Norfolk Southern CEO Alan Shaw failed to show up. Where's Alan? Facing criticism of his own, President Biden reversing course, now saying he plans to visit East Palestine. I've spoken with every official in Ohio, Democrat and Republican, on a continuous basis. Meanwhile, researchers from Carnegie Mellon and Texas A&M universities say while monitoring East Palestine air quality, they discovered one pollutant, acrolin, at levels as much as three times above what's typical for an American city. That's a potential concern because acrolin uh, is what's called a hazardous air pollutant. It can irritate the, the respiratory system. Uh, and so if those higher concentrations are persistent, then that could be a risk to the people in that town. A community entering a new phase of cleanup. The Environmental Protection Agency says once it approves Norfolk Southern's plan, the railroad will start temporarily removing train tracks and digging up contaminated soil. Norfolk Southern says that track removal began today.
Once we open up the ground, uh, there could be uh, some potential vapor releases and odors. The federal agency is also ordering Norfolk Southern to test for toxic pollutants that may have been released during the derailment and chemical burn. Federal investigators revealing they're looking at how melted aluminum from tank cars may have compromised safety after the derailment. And tonight, Ohio's governor's office says 168 people completed an after chemical exposure community survey with 74% reporting headaches and 52% reporting irritation, pain or burning of skin. Data officials will use to make public health decisions. It's scary. It is absolutely scary. And we're already seeing changes. The Association of American Railroads says seven major freight railroads, including Norfolk Southern, have signed on to a voluntary federal system that allows workers to confidentially report close calls. This, as the CEO of Norfolk Southern, is expected to testify on Capitol Hill next week. Tom? Okay, Jesse, we thank you for that. Now, time for the Americas and the hostage standoff in Colombia. This is a strange story. Nearly 80 police officers taken captive by a group of farmers demanding an oil company pay for new roads and better job opportunities. NBC's Guad Venegas on late breaking developments that have just happened tonight in this case. A chaotic scene in San Vicente del Caguan, Colombia, late Thursday. More than 70 police officers surrounded, overpowered, and disarmed, along with nine oil industry workers, all taken hostage. Tonight, the country's president, Gustavo Petro, confirming on Twitter that all officers have been released. The men were first taken captive after violent confrontations left one officer and one farm worker dead and more than 40 people injured, according to local officials. The protesters include the farm workers guard from that rural region demanding that the Emerald Energy Oil Company operating in that area build new roads and infrastructure. Lamentamos que la situación de confrontación que dejó un policía y un campesino muertos y varios heridos, las acciones violentas y las vías de hecho solo generan más violencia y no facilitan los espacios de diálogo entre las partes para encontrar acuerdos. Today, workers from the oil industry responding with a video on Twitter. They reject the violence against captured colleagues and demand the release. Colombian President Gustavo Petro sending in the military and defense minister to restore order while condemning the protesters on Twitter writing, they want to destroy the government and bury Colombia in a war. They have now murdered a young officer. And with the release of the hostages, the Minister of the Interior had indicated the federal government would now negotiate and show their support to the farm workers, also adding that any other groups in the area attempting to take advantage of the situation will feel the full force of the Colombian military. Tom? Okay, Guad Venegas for us on those late-breaking developments. We want to head overseas now to the Middle East. Protests in Israel turning violent, but this time it's Israelis protesting their own government. It's a sight rarely seen, police firing stun grenades on their own people. NBC's Matt Bradley has more on what's causing this escalating divide within the country. Israel spiraling out of control with inner turmoil. Violent protests erupting of Israelis on their own government. The unprecedented demonstrations reaching a breaking point. The rare uprising blocking roads and disrupting trains, clashing with police who fired stun grenades and water cannons. It's all happening as thousands of people across the country took to the streets on Wednesday during a nationwide day of disruption. For two months, Israel has been experiencing regular protests against Prime Minister Netanyahu's plan to reform the courts, which he says is necessary to curb what he calls activist judges. But opponents say it's pushing the country towards authoritarianism. Crowds even gathered outside an upscale hair salon where Netanyahu's wife, Sarah, was getting her hair done. Some chanting in Hebrew, quote, the country is burning and Sarah is getting a haircut. Israeli media said police were called to her aid and she was removed from the scene unharmed. Her husband later tweeting, the anarchy must stop. It can cost lives. And the protests even extended to outside their home in Jerusalem. That demonstrator alluding to a Palestinian village in the occupied West Bank, where violence is the worst in 20 years, according to the Palestinian health ministry. As Israel copes with its own internal unrest, it is also dealing with a wave of violence with the Palestinians uh, in the occupied uh, West Bank. An Israeli raid of a safe house left 11 Palestinians dead last week, 
With militants, the Israeli Defense Forces said they were targeting among them, along with some civilians. Then two Israelis were killed, leading to a mob of Jewish settlers setting Palestinian homes and cars on fire, leaving one dead. At night, the settlers attacked us. I saw them, said this child. When they burned the car, my mother went down with a bucket of water to put out the fire. Netanyahu calling for peace and saying people should not take the law into their own hands, but also vowing to expand the settlements. The newly appointed hardliner finance minister, Bezalel Smotrich, calling on the Israeli government to wipe out the village. <laughs> Saying in Hebrew, I think the village of Hawara needs to be erased. I think the state of Israel should do it. <laughs> the U.S. State Department condemning his comments. These comments were irresponsible. They were repugnant. They were disgusting. And just as we condemn Palestinian incitement to violence, uh, we condemn these provocative remarks that also amount to incitement to violence. The turmoil putting pressure on Israel's government across multiple fronts as the country braces for more violence. Matt Bradley, NBC News. Back here at home, saved by the iPhone. New video of police saving a driver after he crashed into a Florida canal. They say he was unable to call for help, but it turns out his iPhone did it for him. We'll explain. Plus, admission shakeup, the Ivy League school that will no longer require SAT or ACT scores on applications. So how do you get in? And first steps, the incredible moment a six-year-old girl walked on her own two feet for the first time. And you won't believe what she had to go through to get to this moment. Stay with us. Top story just getting started on this Friday night. We're back now with explosive new developments in the murders of those four Idaho college students. Pennsylvania officials unsealing the final warrants involved in the search of the suspect's car and family home. Dana Griffith takes us through the chilling list of what authorities found there. Knives, guns, a black hat and mask. Just some of the over 30 items authorities seized while searching the home and car of accused murderer Brian Kohlberger, according to newly unsealed search warrants. This is State of Idaho versus Brian C. Kohlberger. Kohlberger is charged with the murders of University of Idaho students Ethan Chapin. Madison Mogan, Zana Kernodal, and Kaylee Gonzalez. They were brutally stabbed to death last November inside their off-campus rental home. The two warrants detail for the first time findings of the December 30th search of Kohlberger's Pennsylvania family home and a white Hyundai Elantra, potentially linking him to the crime scene. There is no indication in the documents that any of the knives recovered during the search were the murder weapon. The black clothes and mask could be of particular interest since an affidavit by a surviving roommate describes a, quote, figure clad in black clothing and a mask. Among other items authorities found, a laptop, leafy green substance, and a cell phone. The defense may argue that those were not items that Koberger possessed, but rather someone else in his family possessed or had access to. But all bets are off if DNA from the victims is found on any of those items because no one else in Kohlberger's family apparently had any reason to be across the country. Earlier this week, another warrant in the investigation unsealed. Among the items the FBI recovered, a flashlight, black shorts, and medical grade gloves. Authorities also taking a cheap swab DNA test from Kohlberger during the December 30th search. Equally as interesting in these search warrants is not just what was obtained or seized, but what they were looking for. Both of these give us a lot of information about the direction of the investigation. According to a probable cause affidavit from Moscow police, investigators used video surveillance in the area to connect the homicides to a white Hyundai Elantra, allegedly driven by Kohlberger. The affidavit also says male DNA left on a knife sheath was used to link Kohlberger to the crime scene. No arrest will ever bring back these young students. However, we do believe justice will be found through the criminal process. Investigators still have not revealed a motive. Kohlberger has yet to enter a plea and his attorney could not be immediately reached for comment. But a former attorney did say earlier this year that Kohlberger was eager to be exonerated. His preliminary hearing to determine probable cause is set to take place the week of June 26. Now, while it usually happens 14 days from a defendant's initial appearance, it can be extended at the request of the defense attorney. Back to you. Okay, Dana Griffin for us. Dana, thank you. Now to the Florida man police say was saved by his cell phone. A driver losing control and ending up in a canal. 
Police racing to the scene to pull him out after they say it was his iPhone that told them where to go. NBC Stephen Romo has this story. Your way in. Hey, you got air, right, buddy? Tonight, a harrowing rescue caught on camera. Okay, man. One that happened thanks to in? automated help from an iPhone. Okay. The Martin County Sheriff's Office releasing blurred body cam video of the incident, saying the man's car veered off the road as the driver tried to avoid hitting a wild hog and ended up crashing into a canal. Buddy, hey, you're fine. You're good. It was on an isolated stretch of County Road 609 in Martin County, about 50 miles from West Palm Beach, Florida. Hey, bud, you're doing a, you're doing a great job. Hey, that vehicle landed upside down and started taking on water. We're going to work on the way in. Thankfully, the sheriff's office says the man's iPhone acted on its own, sending an automated crash report to dispatchers. This iPhone was a serious car crash and is not responding to that phone. Giving them the longitude and latitude of that crash location. Our dispatch took the uh, GPS coordinates and put them into a system which told them the nearest address or intersection. And our deputies were able to respond to that crash that actually did occur within eight minutes of the original call. Acting fast with that data, deputies found the car. They knew he was alive and was able to get air, but they then had to figure out how to extract him out of that car. Again, it's upside down. Finally, able to pull the man out of his water-filled vehicle. It's confirmed you're the only occupant. I'm asking I you swear again, you right? Okay. 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 Yeah. Apple's automated crash reporting is a new feature unveiled last year. It's turned on by default if available on a device, which includes the Series 8 Apple Watch as well as the new iPhone 14. It provides an OnStar-like alert to authorities about a suspected crash using GPS data. Google also has a similar feature available on its personal safety app for other devices. Now, your iPhone can connect you with the help you need when you're off the grid. Last December, a couple was rescued in California after their car plummeted off a cliff in Angeles National Forest. They had a shattered phone and no cell service, but were found because of an iPhone crash detection alert. It said, um, uh, collision detected, would you like us to report it to emergency uh, services. The feature already proving to be a lifesaver. The sheriff's office says the driver in the Florida crash was taken to the hospital and treated for only minor injuries, a situation that could have easily been much worse. All right, Stephen Romo joins us now. This is an incredible story. So you were just telling me, you have to have the iPhone 14. So how does the technology work? Do you have to turn it on? And then what happens if you have an Android? Well, the good news for Android users, there's a couple different apps that do this. You just have to search for crash detection in the Google Store, and they'll direct you to those. For Apple, iPhone 14 and the Series 8 Watch, that comes on by default. If you want to make sure it's on, you can just search SOS in your settings and then scroll down to crash detection and you'll see that it's turned on and you'll feel better about it. So uh, it's the new technology only on the new phone right now. And, and you said you, you mentioned on, on the watch as well. You yeah, can, the you new watch this. series. Eight. Okay. And then I have to ask you, I mean, sometimes the technology is great. It's incredible. Save this guy's life. Um, sometimes it can, it can malfunction or it can think you crash. Maybe you're doing a workout or something and it's freaking out. Um, what happens in those situations? How, how can you make sure it doesn't call the police? Yeah, that's actually a point that law enforcement made. They get a lot, apparently, of these false reports so far. Uh, things like skiing has actually set it off before. Uh, it gives Apple gives you 10 seconds to deactivate it if you are skiing or something and you fall and it says there's a crash. You have 10 seconds to turn it off. But they're always refining that system. It only came out just last year, so they're still trying to upgrade it. The sheriff's department we talked to, though, they say they prefer this. They'd rather go out and check some false alarms if it means saving lives. Ski gloves and your ski pants. Right. That just seems like that just seems to take a lot. Longer than 10 yeah. seconds. Okay, Stephen, we appreciate it. When we come back, ExxonMobil sued. Have you heard about this one? The company accused of failing to act while a black co worker faced repeated racism at work, including several nooses found at the job site. The federal lawsuit Exxon is now facing. And the stolen car slamming into a building during a chase, then causing the building to collapse. Look at this video. Why the officers involved are also under investigation. All right, we are back now with Top Stories News Feed, and we begin with a deadly car crash in Maryland that ended with a building collapse. New surveillance video, check this out, shows a driver in a stolen car. He's fleeing from Baltimore, Baltimore police when it crashes into another vehicle and flies onto a nearby sidewalk where a pedestrian was standing. That car then plowing into a vacant building, causing it to crumble. 
That pedestrian was killed and the driver was arrested. The state's attorney general, though, now investigating if officers followed protocol during that pursuit. The federal government suing ExxonMobil over allegations of racism at a plant in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. The suit alleges a black employee's civil rights were violated when five nooses were found at the plant between April 2016 and December 2020. The company is also accused of failing to stop workplace harassment. Exxon has denied all those allegations. And back here at home, a potential game changer for standardized testing. Columbia University announcing they will keep a pandemic policy in place and will no longer require the SAT or the ACT for incoming undergraduate students. It's the first Ivy League school to permanently make those tests optional. They will instead admit students based on, quote, academic talents. All right, next tonight to a top story exclusive, the big steps for one little girl. Six-year-old Elisa was born with a congenital leg condition in Ukraine, fleeing the war zone and coming to America for a life-changing operation. And we were right there to witness some of her first few steps. It's the father-daughter moment Elisa and Volodymyr Zakarchuk had been waiting years for. The final visit to the doctor that could, maybe, help her run and play with her little sister. We like to play this game with Karina, my favorite game. Karina has no problem running, but for Elisa, it's been more than a challenge. But now I cannot run on my own, so I'm running on my father's arms. Since she was born in Ukraine, six-year-old Alicia has struggled to do just that. Born with a congenital leg condition, her right leg grew five inches longer than her left, making it hard to walk, run, and play like any other kid. I want to make her healthy and want to make her legs the same length so she would be able to walk fully, run, and enjoy her life. Her father had made it a mission to find a doctor who could help, searching all over the world for a specialist. Then, early last year, a breakthrough. I looked at her case and I said, yeah, I can help you. If you can get here, we can do it. Dr. Robert Rosbrook of the Hospital for Special Surgery in New York City is an expert in this kind of rare limb lengthening procedure Elisa needed. Since the family was in Ukraine, the doctor met with him virtually. But just six days later, the unthinkable. And good evening. We are coming on the air with breaking news. Ukrainian officials telling NBC News their country is under attack. Russian forces laying siege to the capital of Kiev. Their home, now a war zone. The family picking up what they could and joining the millions fleeing the country. Elisa's mother taking her and her sister Karina to the Czech Republic. But Vola Damer, like all men of fighting age, forced to stay behind. For the next few months, I didn't know what will happen, how the war will go. Her father never giving up hope, securing a special visa to come to New York months later. We have an approximate. The hospital welcoming the family in August for the surgery and covering all medical expenses. So this is my surgical plan to straighten out the leg and to use a fixator with a bone cut here and a bone cut here to lengthen and correct the malalignment. Dr. Rosbrook placing Elisa in a complex leg brace known as a fixator, which allowed him to slowly extend the length of her leg. What followed were six months of grueling doctor visits, but each filled with moments of hope. You are doing so well. Give me five. Good job. Elisa, with the help of a walker, inching closer to walk on her own. Nice. By January, her bones had begun to heal. The fixator taken off Elisa's leg, replaced with a cast, which was removed a few weeks later. So when I first met her, she was walking... Uh, with this prosthetic, something that an amputee would wear. Now she can wear, you know, sort of a more normal, uh, cute shoe. The bone looks very, very good. You see the bone is nice and straight. I'm very confident that by the time this girl is 14 years old, that she's going to have equal leg lengths, straight legs, and be walking like a normal teenage girl. Hello. And we were Hi. right there for Elisa's major test to see if all the treatment, all the therapy was working. Could the little girl with dreams of walking like the other kids cast aside that walker and walk on her own? Here she is, her father still by her side, and Elisa taking some of her first steps 
into her new life. You don't have to speak Ukrainian to understand the struggle and the courage of this little girl. You see how much progress she makes and your eyes fill with tears of joy. When you see your child walking after all of those surgeries, taking her first steps, you are reliving the same feelings as when she was taking her first steps when she was a baby. <laughs> For a family that's been through hardship, setbacks, and even war, now a reason to smile and take a walk. Thank you for watching Top Story. I'm Tom Yamas in New York. Stay right there. More news on the way. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.